It's a great privilege to be able to stand before you this morning. I'm thankful for such an opportunity. If you would like to follow along in either your Bible or your Bible app, we'll be in the book of 2 Timothy, the second chapter. We'll use that as our text. Again, 2 Timothy chapter 2, we'll be reading verses 1 through 7. Paul says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. So with this passage in mind, I would like for us to take a look at the aspects of the Christian. Three of them we just read about. <clears throat> the first one we read was, as a good soldier. We're supposed to endure hardness as a good soldier. As with most soldiers that are involved in carnal warfare, fleshly warfare, they are put through a variety of difficult tasks and obstacles. Now, I've never been in boot camp, but I have heard a few things about it, so I don't at all profess to be an expert on such things. But the things that I have heard, it's not exactly a walk in the park. These things are difficult, but they are designed to push that, that soldier, that trainee, to his limits or her limits to prepare them for battle. And as such, through each of these tasks, that soldier continues to get stronger. Every test that they're put through pushes them to fine-tune their skills and to ultimately prepare for war. Ultimately, that soldier is trained for victory. After all, who fights a war trying to lose? Who does anything trying to lose? They undergo each trial to make them better in order to win. Sometimes that soldier will face adversity from their family. Sometimes their peers, and even their country. This could come in the form of being called names, such as baby killers, which is what we've, we've done to our servicemen and women through certain wars. They might even be cast aside when they return from combat. Many of our veterans are swept under the rug, if you will. The New Testament Christian is a soldier of the cross of Christ. And instead of physical fighting, we're engaged in spiritual warfare every day of our lives. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. The Christian continues to get stronger through each of these trials. Each of these trials, not only in life, but also through reading, this study, reading and studying God's Word, through prayer, through fellowship. The very struggles we go with or go endure provide us an opportunity to grow in God's word, in our Christian walk, our faith in God. All of these are necessary to help us defend the truth of God's word. And it helps us defend it in any error or against any error from any form, from any source. We need this training. It prepares us for everything we must deal with. It helps us ultimately gain the victory. As a Christian, are you trying to gain the victory? We too will face persecution. If you haven't already, you either will or you're not living up to the name Christian. We're told in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, that we will face persecution. That could come in various forms, as with soldiers dealing with their persecution. It could come, again, from our family, our friends, our peers, our co-workers. 
could come from our government. I think it's California that they, they enacted a law that they called, called them pastors, but preachers in general have to submit their sermons before they preach them, basically to get it approved by the government there. Because we don't want to be, be talking about hate speech. We don't be preaching hate speech to others. That's their ideology on that anyway. Don't think that won't ever hit Texas. It's coming at some point. One way or another. You might call to mind the first century and how difficult our brothers and sisters had it while under Roman rule. History tells us that many of them that would not renounce Christ, would not say they would worship Caesar rather than God, they were put to death. They were fed to lions. They were martyred. Some horrible things happened to them. You read about Nero, how, how Christians were used to light his garden. That's a disgusting thing. But they were, they were treated that way because they were faithful to God. We have one martyr mentioned in Acts chapter 7, Stephen. He was preaching the word, and he was stoned for it. Today, our persecution could come in the form of laughter, physical assaults, or even laws. It could also come from our brethren. Paul warned us about false brethren in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, as well as Galatians 2, chapter, or chapter 2, verse 4. Another aspect of the soldier says he entangleth himself not with the affairs of this world. Now, back in Cameron, we had a lot of wooded area. And whenever you were either playing out there or working, you start walking through that brush, and all these vines start catching on your britches. It's more difficult to walk at that point. So you either have to have a machete or a flamethrower just to get out and go back to the non-wooded portion. It's kind of the idea you get when you look at the, the word entangled here. You're tied down. You're getting to know the campground a little too well, as it's been coined by those before me. Whenever someone joins the military, it is a design that they're not to be a part of the world at large. They're separated. They're kept separate from civilian life. We find places like Fort Hood where soldiers are housed. Their daily needs are cared for, but they're carrying on their training to prepare for war separate from civilians. We know that many things of this life can distract a soldier from discharging their obligations that he or she has signed up for to prepare for war, to defend this country. Is the Lord's army any different? Though we are in this world, we must not be of this world. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5, we have the idea that we walk not in the flesh. But we do not war after the flesh. We, we have a spiritual battle to fight. The wrong people we choose to associate with can and eventually will bring us down to their level. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. It was put to me like this. If you're trying to help somebody out of a hole... Which one's going to have the easier job? The one in the hole or you trying to pull them out? Sometimes folks do not want to leave the hole that they're in. And they're going to be easier. It's going to be easier for them to pull you down there in than with them. And we've got to be able to know when that's the case. Part of preparing for the battles we fight. We know from Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 that there are things that can cause us to lose sight of what we're trying to obtain, which should be heaven. It says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, referencing Hebrews chapter 11, let us lay aside every weight and the sin with just, uh, which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Certainly and obviously sin would keep us from our goal of heaven. But it's also those things that are not inherently wrong. It's those things that are, are good. Maybe, you know, going fishing on one day. Going out in the middle of the boat, the lake. 
And my grandpa likes to jug fish. He sees that little jug bouncing across the water. He takes his boat over there, pulls up a nice catfish. Well, what happens if he and his fishing buddies go on Sunday morning? I'm fishing. It's okay. The apostles were fishermen, right? Well, now that joy that he has, that recreational avenue has now beset him from his goal of heaven. And there's many other things that could that could entangle us that aren't necessarily wrong in and of themselves, but if we put them as a higher priority than serving God, they become a weight. I know my mom, she had uh, those ankle weights that Velcro to your ankles. They're bags of sand, and the idea was that you start walking with them and you build up muscle strength. Well, some people have a lot of ankle weights on, and it's slowing them down, spiritually speaking, from, ma from reaching their goal. After all, we must keep in mind what the world at large has to offer us. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Furthermore, instead of being the world, we're supposed to be separated from it. We're supposed to be transformed. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. We mentioned Fort Hood earlier. This assembly is kind of like our Fort Hood. We're gathered for a purpose. We're gathered for worshiping God. Now, of course, the home should be a way to prepare. We should be doing a lot of teaching in that, that's, that situation, that home. But when we gather with other Christians, we're also being built up for our battles. We're engaging in fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Maybe you have war stories that I haven't even heard of yet and I haven't even dealt with. Now you're going to help prepare me to fight my own and, like, and vice versa. Now if you have a soldier that doesn't show up for training the next day, what do they normally call them? Said they went AWOL, absent without leave. There's a lot of folks that are AWOL. It's been kind of joked about that I'm, I'm similar to Santa Claus because I, I do the attendance sheet. I make a list and I do check it twice, sometimes thrice. And we know who's naughty and nice based on who's here and who's not. Where are you on Sunday? It's a good thing to be gathering with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And even when you are here, where are you? Are you looking at your phone, playing on the Facebook and all these other social media outlets? Are you on Amazon, maybe ordering a pair of sneakers? I don't know. could be anything. We are assembled with the purpose and intent to worship our Creator, God Almighty. Where are we? We could be physically here, but are we mentally here? We could be checked out. It's not a good thing. Another aspect of the soldier that the Christian must possess is the attitude to please him who hath chosen him. Paul tells us that the good soldier will please the one that chose him. How does a soldier go about pleasing his commanding officer? The answer is obvious. It's obedience. Commanding officer says, take that hill. You take that hill. Jesus says, preach the gospel. You preach the gospel. God has always been pleased with obedience. Nothing less. 1 Samuel chapter 15 verses 22 through 23 says, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee for being king. John 14, verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. It doesn't get much more simple than that. As well as James chapter 1, verse 23 through 25, we know that obedience is necessary in pleasing our Savior, pleasing our God. 
What happens to the soldier that becomes unruly? I reckon it's just like any other team. I know in football we we had a lineman or a receiver, whoever, that just wasn't carrying their weight. You go over there and you beat them over the head. You all had helmets on, so it wasn't like you're taking a rock and smashing them. You grab them, come on. Where are you, where's your head at? We have a job to do, and that's to win football games. Score touchdowns. Well, I, So I'm sure fellow soldiers would have a hand in disciplining their unruly fellow soldiers. Probably have a few choice words and actions for them. Beyond that, they might get dishonorably discharged. My uh, grandfather, he was in the army, but he ended up getting injured. So he didn't complete boot camp. So he was honorably discharged. But if you have an unruly soldier, they get kicked out. And they're no longer able to take the honors and privileges that go along with that particular branch of the military. Something similar happens to the child of God that becomes unruly. We find in 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 6, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he, which he received of us. The idea of walking disorderly, you're out of step. And if you've ever seen a military, really a brigade or parade of any sort, they're walking in step. And you can, you can just about keep a beat to it. And it's a very interesting sight to behold. Christians are to be walking in step. If we're not, our fellowship with God the Father ceases. Whenever we withdraw fellowship from a brother or sister in Christ, and as walking disorderly, we're not legislating for God. It's not a rule that we make up. The fellow soldier has already lost their fellowship with God the Father. We as humans are simply acknowledging that fact, and now you no longer have fellowship with us. We're carrying out God's law in that, according to His Word. We're simply acknowledging the fact of the fellowship no longer existing, not only with God, but with us as individuals and the church. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18, Paul tells Timothy, This charge I commend unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou might by them mightest war a good warfare. Fight a good warfare. Do your part as a soldier. After all, again, that's what we're here for. That's one aspect of the Christian. To engage in spiritual warfare. The second aspect. Strive for masteries. Verse 5, we read it before, but we'll read it again. It says, And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. The phrase here, strive for masteries, means to engage in a contest or to contend in public games. Athleho. Sound familiar? Thus the Christian can be pictured as an athlete. Think about how we train for certain events. I know in powerlifting, where we had our, our meetings, we'd get stronger by lifting more weights. You don't just go in there and start picking up weight. There's a specific regimen you need to follow in order to get stronger. You'd also have to remain at the same weight for competition. So you'd have to lose a little bit of fat, gain a little bit of muscle. Okay, there's a, there's a balance there. Based on the, the weight class you wanted a place for. But we're training for competition. Part of that was eating the right food. You could, you could go to Golden Corral every meal and get your fill of their buffet, but you're not going to make your weight class. In football, we trained every day. We'd lift weights. We would run literally until we puked. Do we have that same type of dedication to God? Spiritually speaking, what food are we eating? Jesus said that He is the bread of life. 
John chapter 6, verse 35, as well as 48. He is the very Word of God. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, as well as verse 14. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, and 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. What is our outlook toward the very Word of God? Are we studying it daily? Do we train? Do we work out? Do we challenge ourselves to grow? It always helped me, as I'm sure many of my other fellow linemen, to have somebody there running with us, like a running back or somebody that was faster. They'll give you motivation to catch up to them. I know I could run a whole lot faster in the game than I could normally, unless, of course, somebody's chasing after me. That's a little bit different. But that adrenaline keeps going, and you, it pushes you to your limits, and even sometimes beyond what you think you can do. Do we challenge ourselves to grow? Do we study or discuss the Bible with others? Because remember, Christians and athlete, we're trying to obtain something. Can you be more spiritually active? Do you support the congregation of which you're currently a member of? Are there opportunities to do the Lord's work, such as evangelizing, door knocking, and the like? I was told once there was a preacher that for a while he would pray that God would give him opportunities to spread the word. Well, he stopped praying for those opportunities. He instead prayed to acknowledge those opportunities that he already had. We keep praying for opportunities, and that's, that's a good thing to do. But what about the ones we already have? Are we taking them? The athlete strives for a crown. What good would athletics be without a trophy? We're not talking about a participation trophy where you get one just for showing up. We're talking about using your skills to better your team. Not just buying snacks for everybody, being the water boy. You get a trophy too because you participated. But instead, getting a trophy through hard work and dedication to that cause. You know, I've got a Letterman jacket, and I've got several patches on it, several patches that I never bought, but I could, to show how we as the Cameron Yeoman, the football team, did in a particular season. Now, I'm a little bit more proud of my powerlifting medals, because that's an individual accomplishment. I've got a glass showing how well I did at, at UT. I've got all these different medals that show that I can carry my weight. But they're nice to look at and they're nice to think of all the memories. But you know what they're really good for? Fueling the fire of the last day. Because they're all going to be burned up. Instead, we need to be more concerned about obtaining a spiritual crown. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 24, says... Know ye not that they which run a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery, in this sense it's fighting, you're contending, is temperate or restrained in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. The idea of keeping under, the, the idea there is signifying to strike with clenched hands, it's a boxing term. To strike under the eye, to beat the face black and blue. And the dictionary actually says it's used metaphorically of Paul's suppressive treatment of his body in order to keep himself spiritually fit. In the Olympic Games of old, the winners would be given an olive leaf wreath or an olive crown as they won in their event. So that's more than likely the type of crown that Paul is referencing here for these people who run in that race. For us today, we know that we have suffered, we know if we do suffer with Jesus, we will also reign with him. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. Our faithful service to Him will be rewarded through a crown of righteousness, 
2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, and Revelation 2, verse 10. Well, there's only real, really one way to obtain that crown. And that's if you strive lawfully. If we are to win that crown, we must strive lawfully. Just as athletes that participate in events must follow the rules. A few years ago, Lance Armstrong was an elite cyclist. I know I grew up hearing about him. He was a pretty swell sounding guy. He placed in, I think I counted as like 30 or so different races. He placed in the top five. Most of those, he was first. A couple of them, he was second. Even less than that, he was fifth. But a highly decorated cyclist. He won that crown several times. But we find out later that, uh, Mr. Armstrong, you've been using performance-enhancing drugs. Found out that that was an accusation that was true. He even confessed to it. Everything that he had accomplished now erased because he cheated. He cheated to gain the victory. Now several, if not all sports, consider this cheating as it is a serious offense using steroids and other types of drugs, doping and whatnot. We had a case of that during our last Olympics. The Russians were doping. Well, you reckon they were still going to try to win? Of course. That's why they're there. But they got caught. The moral of that story is not don't get caught. It's follow the rules. Do the right thing. Well, can a Christian take spiritual steroids? Wouldn't that be nice over here reading? reading. That's not what we're talking about. Can a Christian cheat in the sense of their spiritual walk? We can be deceived into thinking that we're doing God's work when in reality we're not. Now we all live by a philosophy. It's our set course that we, we try to live by. And it is also possible for others to influence us to follow their own faulty philosophy. We're warned in Colossians 2 verse 8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Some philosophies we might encounter, one of them comes from uh, Niccolo Machiavelli. I'm sure I butchered that name, so sorry, Mr. Niccolo. He coined the idea of the ends justify the means. Fairly certain we've heard that before. We might also come into contact with the iron rule, which might makes right. Humanistic naturalism. Where mankind is the measure of all things. He's the highest in this universe. We might also come into contact with the idea of participating in even a good thing to the exclusion of all others. We talked recently in a sermon about the monks. Is it not a good thing to be studying God's word every day? Well now... They're separated from the world. One, they're not salt of the earth. Can't be part of the earth, part of the salt saver if you're not actually in the material that you're supposed to be preserving. You're also not teaching others. So you're chasing after a good thing but excluding everything else. I heard recently there was a preacher that traveled all over the world. He preached umpteen sermons. But he was never home. He failed as a husband and a father. It cannot be stressed enough that we must build our own philosophy, our whole manner of life on a thus saith the Lord, keeping in mind the scripture up here behind me. Colossians 3 verse 16. We must also note a second way for many to strive unlawfully. Many today think that they are doing God's work. They may, in fact, be doing the same things that God has commanded. However, they receive condemnation. This setting is pictured in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Here Jesus pronounces sentence on these people. 
those that did even good things in life, but they were not qualified to be members of the household of God. They were never, in this scenario, subject to God's rule. Until one obeys the plan of salvation that God has set forth, that individual cannot expect heaven as their home, even though they might be doing good things as outlined in Scripture. They're not qualified to accept the benefits. The third aspect is the husbandman that laboreth. Verse 6 is the husband, husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. When you look up that term husbandman, it refers to one who tills the soil and raises food. This was one of the major occupations of the ancient Hebrews, along with shepherding. The farmer of ancient times was responsible for all aspects of farming. All the plowing, planting, tending, and harvesting was done by the farmer and his family. More prosperous farmers were able to hire helpers for their farm. In the New Testament, a farmer is one who owns the land or rents it and raises crops. Now again, you don't try to be a farmer attempting to fail. You want to raise crops. You want to make money. You want to provide for yourself and your family. So the goal there is to win as well. In order to be a successful husbandman, or a farmer, we must be able to tend our own soil, our own soil first and foremost. We are responsible for ourselves. Does it make any sense for a farmer today to neglect his own crops and to go down the street and help and help another farmer, or help anybody for that matter, till their own soil while his falls into disrepair? I think we'd all consider that a crazy idea. We'll probably sing this song this afternoon, but we typically do on every fourth Sunday or last Sunday. Talk about how the wise man builds his house on the rock. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27. You've got to build your own house on a stable foundation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. We're all responsible for ourselves and we're going to give account for the things that we have done in this life. Luke chapter 8 shows us the, the different types of, of soils, or rather the different classifications that the, the hearts of men would fall into. Because ultimately there's only two kinds. There's a good heart and a bad heart. But there's three different groupings of the bad heart. Do you have an honest heart? When presented with the truth, do you make the necessary changes? Because an honest man can lie. But whether they remain honest is determined by what they do next. Are you going to continue in that lie? Then you cease being honest. Or are you going to turn from it? Repent of that lie. You maintain your honesty. How are we receptive to the Word of God? Are we receptive to it? Our individual responsibility and duty is to keep and maintain our honesty, to keep ourselves from going crazy. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. God has given us everything we need to do that. It's up to us to maintain it. The crops that we typically try to grow all need proper nutrients. They need correct levels of sunlight. They need protection. They also need weed removal. The Christian must employ similar tactics in order to remain faithful to God. We find in John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8, that God is the husbandman, and Jesus is the true vine. And Christians, as we're added to the church, we become branches. And our purpose is to glorify God by bearing not just fruit, but much fruit. In contrast to the works of the flesh, we're told about the fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians 5, 22 and 26. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against there is such no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Notice that this list makes up the singular list or the fruit of the Spirit. 
We must exhibit all of these qualities in order to be faithful. We're also fruit inspectors as Christians. Oftentimes we apply Matthew 7 verse 20 to only others. But it applies to us as well. Not only from the standpoint of somebody looking at me and the fruit that I bear, but myself. What kind of fruit am I bearing? We must be concerned about not only tilling our own soil, but also the world's soil. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. As well as Luke chapter 24, verses 46 and 47. We typically refer to these as the Great Commission. For great is that commission. We need to be teaching others. That's how we toil. Well, that's how we toil and that's how we till. It is the church's task to soul save. We do that by spreading the gospel. Think about the judgment scene. You reckon you'll see any of your coworkers there? You reckon you'll see people you saw at Walmart? You reckon you'll see your brethren? That song, you never mentioned him to me, always sends chills up my spine. Can they legitimately say, you never mentioned him to me? Or can that be a false accusation? We've got to use the time we've been given wisely. Finally, we must till family soil. Certainly, we must be concerned about our physical, flesh and blood family members. After all, it is the duty of the mother to guide the home and the fathers to head that home. And we must also make sure that our children grow up in a God-fearing home so that one day they can leave that home and go start their own. That is all true. But as far as tilling family soil, we're primarily concerned about taking care of the household of God. We all must be mindful of each other. After all, we're here striving. We're here fighting spiritual battles with one another. We are a family. We're a team. You know, we have ladies' class every month. They're talking about the, spirit, or the fruit of the Spirit. We have a younger ladies' class every month. We have other events that are designed to build each other up. Are you there building each other up? Are you there building yourself up? We all need that to some extent or another. Some more than others. But are you benefiting from these events? We find in Galatians 2.11 that Paul withstood Peter to, this, to his face. Did he do it because he hated him? No. He demonstrated his agape love for his fellow apostle and fellow brother in Christ. Would we do that for each other? Eric, you're wrong in doing that. Turn or burn. Whatever it might be. Now, of course, we should be able to self-analyze. But in the case that we don't, we rely on each other and say, hey, you were wrong in that. In the same book, Paul tells us how to help each other in that regard. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Brethren, if, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one of those burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Do you possess the traits we've just discussed? Or have you become entangled in this world? Are you striving lawfully? Are you bearing good fruit? Because remember, we all will bear fruit. Sometimes it's not good fruit, though. Are you bearing good fruit? If you answered no to either of these questions, something's wrong. And certainly we all have room for growth, but that doesn't mean, doesn't mean you continue in that sin until who decides how long. You cease from sin. You try to do better. You do better. Seems like that's repentance. It's exactly what that is. Stop doing wrong. Start doing right. As a Christian, have you fallen short or missed the mark? 
As a child of God, you can be restored through repentance and prayer. 1 John chapter 1, verses 1-7 through 7, and James chapter 5, verse 17. However, if you've not become a Christian, then you have no right to that avenue yet. You can, though, through obedience to the gospel, hearing, believing, repenting, confessing Christ, and being baptized for the remission of your sins, you're now able to be a Christian. You are a Christian at that point. And then you're added to the Lord's church, Acts 2.42. From there you must live faithfully unto your death in order to obtain heaven as your eternal home. Each of us will occupy eternity. It is determined by how we live in this life. Where? Are we going to be faithful to God? Are we going to be faithful to Satan? 2 Corinthians 5, 10 through 11. We know that we will give account of the deeds done in this body. Are you ready for that day? If not, why not? Whether you need to repent of sin or become a Christian, please use this time as it's been designated to make it right before your Creator as we stand and sing.